is about the things that you can do to prepare your applications for adulthood. Um, I'm going to ask some questions, maybe a couple. Most of them just going to talk at you. So uh, this is me. Uh, I write some things periodically at stevenrbay.com. You can reach me on Twitter. My Twitter feed is really vulgar, so uh, be warned in advance. Um, email me and tell me how much this presentation sucks. That's awesome. Mostly, I would like to just talk about these ideas. These are ideas that are um, these are ideas that are developing. These are ideas. We can start a little club. Like at my daughter's school, we have a parents advisory council, and we sort of get together in a little club and talk about how we can raise our children better and make their education better. So we can have a little club and you know talk about how to raise our applications into responsible, mature adults. Um, so my first computer program was when I was eight years old. I wrote a hockey trivia game. Um, as Kobe covered out in Canada. So the hockey trivia market is underserved. <laughs> there are very few of those applications now. Um, but what I learned in my first version of my hockey trivia application was that, um, you know, every, everything was like, I, I learned in, in basic how to, how to print out some, tests, uh, some text and ask somebody to type in an answer and then tell them if they were right or wrong. And uh, that was fun. And when I wanted to add a new question to my hockey trivia game, I copied the last one and pasted it and edited the text, because I'm sure a lot of you guys do that too. <laughs> we all do it from time to time. So uh, over time, my hockey trivia game became unmaintainable. It was, you know, I refactored it, and I, but eventually it just got to the point where I couldn't do anything more with it. I couldn't add new questions. Uh, I couldn't add new questions. I couldn't make it more interesting. And it, it sucked, and I was devastated. I was a very happy, unhappy little third grader. So uh, the hockey trivia market is underserved, as I said. I mean, how many app, hockey trivia apps are there out there? And so if I knew, if I knew how to write maintainable software when I was eight years old, that market would be covered. So, but I, di I didn't. And so since then, I tortured myself and, and, and worked on how do I make my applications future proof? What can I? What decisions that I'm making today affect? the things that I have to do to fix my application tomorrow, and five months from now, and five years from now. And uh, those are really interesting questions, and sometimes they're not obvious. Sometimes the things, a, a decision that you made that sounded perfectly reasonable six months ago is really holding up things now. And uh, let's see, so because of the, the time that I learned Rails, which is the week after it was released, my focus on quality and testability and, and, and future-proofing your applications, uh, most of my lap, most of the six years that I've been working in Ruby and Rails, uh, nearly exclusively, has been spent doing firefighting gigs. So, people very often call me when they have like you know, the worst code ever, and can you please fix it? And it's uh, I can't always fix it, but I always learn something, and that's what this is. Uh, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, right? Uh, so okay, so. Um, so Pac-Man is an example of something that exists forever. We played Pac-Man last night over, over here, this four-player Pac-Man. It's awesome. Um, I, I asked, I went to the bar and asked, you know, where, where are the rest of the nerds from the conference? And Matt said, I have no idea where all the nerds are. I've been playing Pac-Man. So, um, so we never did find the nerds. We just drank beer and played Pac-Man. Um, people still play Pac-Man today. We played it last night for a while. It's it's an application. I mean, it's a very contrived example, um, but it's an it's a it's an application that was written a long time ago. It was first released in 1980, and people still do it. People still play Pac-Man. I'm sure it's been rewritten and stuff like that. It's a very contrived example, but software often lasts a lot longer than you think it will. And uh, Pac-Man is probably a great example of that. I mean, how many people still play Tetris or a variant of Tetris? Right, I still play Tetris, and I'm sure that when Tetris was made, it wasn't going to be, you know, people are going to play this for 30 years. I don't think that's what they had in mind. 
but people do. And so people are going to use your software for way, way longer than you want them to. Right now, I work in the finance industry. We, we transfer money between banks. Um, Steve forgot a slide uh, where he talked about our PC and stuff like that. The other <coughs> form of APIs, when you're talking to a uh, software written in COBOL in 1975, is uh, you take a CSV file and you FTP it somewhere. <laughs> and so this this is, I mean, the, oh, it still works. This is this is software that was written a long time ago, and we, we interact with it every day. So it's really important to think about these things. So uh, Ruby on Rails apps, as I said, they're getting to be like a decade old. There are, there are Rails apps at the wild that are going to hit the decade in production milestone very soon in just a couple of years. In five years, we will have many applications that are written on Rails that have been out for 10 years. And it's amazing. So uh, how many how many people here are working on Rails that's more than a year old? Three years, more than three years old, more than five years old. OK, so a couple. All right. Um, so for the people who are working on apps that are more than five years old, keep your hands up. Put your hands down after, if there is poorly thought out code, legacy decisions, or stuff you wish you didn't have to deal with. A lot of it out there. So Rails makes things makes easy things really easy. You can get a blog in ten minutes. If you want to build an application, it takes a little bit longer than that. But most of us get started with the, the ten minute blog. I got started with a ten minute blog. Um, I've never deployed a ten minute blog. So it's you know so at some point you have to improve. You have to think a little bit longer term about your problems. Um, to build large application software, you need to plan for the future a little bit. And I'm not talking about big upfront design because I hate that as much as the next guy. I'm talking about just simply be aware that what you do today needs to be maintained and supported tomorrow and it may not be maintained and supported by you. And this is a small community. And so be nice to be nice to your peers and leave them, you know, leave things as well as you can. So I want to thank Joe and Mike Moore, but you don't know that yet because I think he feels late today. Um, at lunch today, a friend and I were talking about the theme of some of the talks today. We're very pleased and excited by the fact that people are talking about basically maturity in, in the Rails community. Things like object-oriented design are coming out, things like my talk, and Mike Moore's going to talk about things like that as well, and Joe talked about, you know, here, here's how we move forward. We're talking about, um, we're talking about what, how to prepare ourselves for the future. Um, I don't see old as being necessarily a bad thing, especially in software or in cars or people, um, in most things. Uh, my daughter probably thinks I'm too old to be cool. I don't think I'm getting older. I'm just getting better. And I hope that everybody here is getting better. I want to talk about some things for making your app get better. And so everyone knows about the popular slide that EHH made a cat on Rails in 06 and what he had to say about the enterprise, and uh, what he had to say about the status quo. Well, in 2012, we are the enterprise, and we are the status quo. And I don't want the next framework people to be going and saying those things about us, because we left them messes, and we left them in a bad spot. And so we're learning things now about what we can do for the future. I once built a house with my dad. It was a couple years ago in Canada in the winter. <laughs> and until the roof was on, we started every day by shoveling a few feet of snow off the floor. That was the first half of the day. And I learned more about software development in the six months or so that I spent part time helping my dad build his house than I did in the decade prior to helping my dad build his house, in the decade that I spent writing software before that. And this is why I'm a fan of the craftsmanship movement. There are a lot of parallels between building houses and other trades and writing software. We can learn a lot from the construction industry. A large part of the construction industry is for renovating and modifying existing houses. It's a very low barrier for entry uh, industry. Anybody who swings a hammer can probably get a contract to renovate a bathroom, won't necessarily do it well, can get the contract. We have a TV show in Canada called Homes on Homes. Has anybody heard of that? Yes, isn't that awesome? Okay, so Mike Holmes is an awesome upper Canadian dude that uh, goes in and cleans up messes. Um, for a large part of the time that I've been working on Rails apps, I've been the Mike Holmes of Rails apps. 
and it's 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 uh, just where we are. So in the software world, instead of you know adding or or, or improving a house or uh, oh my god, I just said house. I've been way I've been here way too long. <laughs> so instead of renovating houses, <laughs> we will do the software. When we renovate a house, we add rooms to it. We improve existing rooms or things like that. Um, building new houses is an important part of, of the construction industry. But when someone wants something about their house changed, they renovate. In the software world, very often, when somebody wants to have something changed, if it's perceived to be a big change, like making your garage taller, which you'll see in a moment, um, we do the what would be the construction equivalent of bulldozing your house and building you a new one. It's been a number of years since I helped my dad build his house. I don't remember exactly how many. Um, I blocked most of it out. It was like 40 below most of the time. Um, soon it'll be time to replace the roof. You have about 10 years out of a roof. If the construction industry did imitate the software industry, we, my dad would be calling me and saying, hey, can you drive the bulldozer? Because we've got a leak in the roof. I don't want to see that. I don't like seeing that in software. I think that we can, by being better about what we're doing, we can uh, we can stop bulldozing our software, and so it's not about the cost. You can't. It, it's not possible. I thought for a while maybe maybe we just bulldoze and redo software because it's cheaper than building houses, but it's not actually. Um, many renovations to houses, adding a bedroom, raising raising it a level or something like that. Many of those renovations actually <coughs> cost very close to the price that it would cost to bulldoze the house and build a new one. I did it again. Uh, my accent is uh, chameleon, apparently. So uh, the equivalent, and, and, and the equivalent in software costs far more. You can bulldoze a house and build a new one in the time and effort that it will take to bulldoze and build a new house. Uh, that time and effort will cost a lot more in software, typically, especially when there's a high demand for people right now, which is why you should be getting a hold of my friend Josh very quickly. Um, so this is uh, Steve Simmons' house. He's a, a member of an online community for uh, MG Nuts. It comes from his website, mgnuts.com. Kind of a British car fetish. This guy had a garage. He needed a bigger garage because he likes British cars. And uh, he didn't bulldoze his house to get a bigger garage. He's made the current garage bigger. Oh. And uh, I suspect he's going to have to build a bigger garage at some point as well. This one is looking a little bit tight. That was the day after it was finished. Um, so uh, I think he's going to need a new one soon. In the software world, we would have bulldozed his house to give him a bigger garage. We do it again later. I don't like seeing that. So uh, as your app grows, you're going to get some. There's going to be some pain associated with that. Uh, sometimes things take longer than you than you want them to, and a lot of teams are noticing that development speed slows over time. This is usually a result of poor decision making. And think about it, if you, if you learn about more about your domain as you go, and you get the foundation laid for building new features and things, shouldn't things go faster over time? Shouldn't those little features just be faster to implement? And they should be. Um, when you, if you read any of the material on extreme programming, the XP cost of change curve is nearly flat. Or over time, it'll decrease if, as you understand more about what you're doing. But most pro software projects aren't experiencing this because they're doing, they're, they're not planning for the future appropriately and they're being hasty and uh, you know, responding to things uh, quickly, you know, what they need now rather than what they will need for the future. And so I'm going to go over some of the things that will cause a lot of future pain or some of the solutions. One of the ideas that's really important is convention over configuration. Um, another 20, 20 years from now, when Rails is a distant memory, when uh, you know, when Rails is what COBOL is now, when you know everybody laughs that I have to interact with a COBOL system written in the seventies, but twenty years from now, people are going to laugh when you have to interact with that. Oh my God, you're writing software that talks to a Rails app that was written in two thousand six. How do you deal with yourself? And uh, if nothing else, if we learn nothing else from Rails, from our time spent uh, developing Rails apps and, and changing the way we think about problems. Conventional configuration is the one thing we need to take with us. This is the best idea in Rails, I think. There are many great ideas in Rails. There are a lot of things that are pulled from other places. There are a lot of things we do wrong. This is the good one. It's a paradigm shifting idea, and we should all remember this. 
Still do some configuration when you need it. Uh, convention or configuration doesn't mean don't use configuration. It means that if there's a sensible default, assume the sensible default. Your Google Maps API key is not a sensible default. That's configuration value. Um, the place the, and, the, and the manner in which you report your exceptions, that's also configuration. That's not a sensible default. But those are application specific very often. Um, if you have conventions, it helps your team um, uh, get, get up to speed on your app and, and know where things go and new things need to be added. Where do I put this? What does it look like? Who do I talk to? Those conventions, not just in software, not just the low level day to day writing code conventions, the conventions for you know how to interact with your team members and things like that. How do you solve problems? Those are great conventions to focus on. Um, there's often a discrepancy between a Rails convention and an object-oriented convention, or a Rails convention and you know the way that a lot of software shops operate, things like that. This is where you're going to have to make a lot of really difficult decisions. For some reason, the Rails community calls templates views, and they think that Rails MVC, even though there's no views in Rails, there are just templates, and decorators are called presenters, and REST is not REST, as Steve was kind enough to point out. And these are not things we're going to get away. Steve pointed out that we can't, we can't reteach people that what you call REST is not. So we just have to stop using those words. I don't think we have to do the same thing with templates and views and decorators and presenters because those are used everywhere else. People know what decorators and presenters are in, in other, other communities. Small talk, for instance. Um, it's always great. I like to compare things to the small talk community because I mean, Ruby is just called Ruby because it hasn't been perfected yet. Smalltalk was called Smalltalk 80 because that's when they perfected it. It was perfect in 1980. So when we perfect Ruby, it'll be called like Ruby 36 or something. <laughs> so um, convention, team conventions, another team conventions, like where if, if your model doesn't inherit from active record base, what is it? It's still a model. Some teams call those libraries, some teams call those services, but it's still a model whether it inherits from active record base or not. So these are things that are that, that affect um, how you think about designing your software. Because if you think that a model has to have an associated database table, that affects the design of your software. And uh, there are important decisions that are made because of this. This is where your team has to make a judgment call. You have to decide what is called a model and things like that. And this will uh, vary from team to team, but you need to avoid violating a convention. Every time you violate the conventions, you have to cover it in two places. Number one, you have to cover it in the code, uh, or sorry, the configuration where you violated this convention. You have to configure for that. Um, I mean, one of the one of the most common examples, and I don't recommend against using RSpec, obviously, but when you use RSpec, you have to change some of the configuration to do that. And you have to ask yourself, since the test unit is the default, and I want to use RSpec, is the value that I'm getting from using something different worth the cost of changing that default. And in Rails 3, that's, that cost is almost nil. But back in Rails 1.2 or earlier, it was really difficult to get to that place where you could reasonably use RSpec and things stopped assuming that you were definitely using test unit. Um, so you have to document it. You have to cover it in the configuration. You also have to cover it in the documentation. When I'm ramping up on your project or when I'm looking for where things go, if you're bringing someone new on your team, you need to be able to go to one place and say, hey, um, why is this not acting in the same way that it did on the last project I worked on? Your application, DHH is, is famous for saying, you are not a unique snowflake. Your application is not a unique snowflake. I bet there are very few people in this room that are working on something that has truly never, ever been done before. And so we want to be able to have new people joining your project, know what's what, a little bit of extra, whatever little bit of extra domain specific knowledge, but if you're working in a complicated industry, we're working in a finance industry right now, for instance, there's a lot of domain knowledge I need to learn. I don't want to have to learn all the ways that my team has broken the Rails framework, as well as all of the domain knowledge that I have to learn as well. <coughs> These, uh, so just to ease onboarding and when Rails upgrades come out, anybody who's done a Rails 3 upgrade recently, I see some really sad people. You guys have done Rails 3 upgrades recently. So that's, this is not, this is, these are the kinds of things. When you break the convention, you pay for it when you do a Rails 3 upgrade. Those are important things to think about as well. Uh, generating code 
is a huge issue for a lot of projects that I've been on as well. Every line of code has a cost associated with it. And that cost is the price that it costs to maintain that line of code. So if you have a class that is 100 lines, that class probably costs twice as much to maintain as the 50 line class. Again, temper this with a metric ask on salt, but in general, these things are really important. Um, if you are, gen Ruby is really dynamic. If you're generating code, you can definitely be calling it from somewhere else. So there's almost no good reason to ever be generating code in Ruby. Generated code is actually more expensive to maintain than code that you wrote. Because it wasn't written using any of the conventions, domain knowledge, or any of the, the institutional knowledge that you have on your team. It wasn't written by somebody on your team. And so the generated code is not going to, to often not going to fit uh, in with your project. Delete code. Everybody here probably has code in their projects that never gets touched by a user, rarely gets touched by a user, is nearly useless, but for some reason or another it's expensive to delete, it's expensive to change, or whatever. If you delete it, you don't have to pay the maintenance costs on it. Um, how many features, like, I'm sure everybody has these features. Uh, we've got a lot of features that nobody uses. We're getting rid of uh, a huge set of features in our current app right now because people, it, just the users didn't use it. We added it, nobody used these features uh, about storing multiple balances, I think. Nobody used the features. It's really complicated code to maintain. We're deleting it. Technical debt is an important one, that uh, for, an important idea that people talk about. Um, I haven't seen a lot of cases where people really approach it in a, in a great way. Um, Technical debt, for those of you that don't know, is a phrase coined by Ward Cunningham, Ward Cunningham refers to the, basically the cost of the consequences of poor design choices that are made today. And the, the, the debt metaphor works because if you make a poor choice today, you are going to pay for that poor choice continually and in a growing way over the life of your project until you fix that poor choice that you made. Sometimes it's a, a quick hack to get things out the door. Sometimes it's a, a third party blocker, this, this team over here, this, this group is not giving you what you need to do your job, so you have to you know, put in a shim. Sometimes your understanding of the problem just isn't, in, isn't good enough yet because your user, you don't have users if it's a new project, or your users are interacting with it in a different way than you thought. The important thing to do is limit the amount of technical debt you're introducing in your project, and also start paying off the interest, start fixing those problems. When your understanding improves, Go back and fix the code to match your updated understanding. So one thing that I like to do is adopt the Boy Scout rule. The Boy Scout rule leave things cleaner than you found them. Every time you check out some old code that's already written and you notice something, fix it. Um, I like to, there, I believe there's rate cast in Rails 3 now. I have a couple of custom things that I use uh, to find fix me notes in the code. I write a lot of fix me notes every time I'm introducing technical debt. Really easy to find then. Listen to your tests, if you have tests. I hope most people, or I hope everybody here has tests. But your tests are going to tell you a lot of things about your code because your tests are using the code. When you have tests, your tests are using the code, the production environment is using the code. And those are, that's a really important thing because then um, your code is decoupled by definition. Your slow tests are going to point out that you have slow code. Your fragile tests are going to refer to fragile code. When you change something over here and something over here breaks, that means that you've got some tight coupling that you need to resolve. Um, your tests are going to tell you more about your code. They tell you more about your code than whether your code is correct or not. They tell you a lot of different things about your code. So don't get mad at your tests. Your tests are telling you important information. And the more it hurts, the more important that information is likely to be. Design patterns are really useful for having a shared vocabulary. If I'm describing to you how I'm solving a problem and I can say, I, we do this with that pattern, that's a really great way to do it. Um, you automate, if you already are familiar with the same design patterns, you, I don't have to explain the whole, the whole thing. I don't have to draw a picture. I don't have to let you read the code. For instance, we process filters by sending them through a series of, you know, the, through the chain responsibility pattern. If you're familiar, familiar with that pattern, you know where to look it up. You don't have to read all the code. They're called patterns for a reason. They exist in lots of software. And yours isn't a unique snowflake. So you're going to find these places where you can adopt these patterns. It's going to improve communication. 
You have to manage your dependencies. Coupling is really important. Coupling is between classes, between everything in your code. Some of the things where coupling is going to give you huge problems in ways that you might not have noticed is uh, sometimes it's really easy to have your application coupled to a particular database. Most people who are using Active Record are already coupled to a SQL database or uh, a database that is supported by Active Record. If you have find by SQL or custom execute commands or whatever where you're, it, where you're using raw SQL, you are probably also tightly coupled to whichever database you're using in production. And when people talk about coupling in software, they're often not talking about how is my application tightly coupled to the database I'm using. Object-oriented design is going to be really important for this. And uh, this is the last thing I have to say on this. There, this is an entire talk in itself. But please learn about the object-oriented design principles, the practices. The ASD PPP book by Uncle Bob is a great book. It covers solid. Uh, I'm working on, a, on an e-book called the Solid Rails book. Um, which you can hit here, you can sign up for information about it. I expect to be done in the next month or two. And uh, it'll tell you how to apply the solid principles to Rails, helping your um, maintainability and stuff like that. <coughs> so uh, that's all I have to say on that. We can do some, uh, I'd like to have more conversations about this over time, so everybody that wants to talk about this, tell me I'm stupid, find me afterwards. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, whatever, and then you can email me. Thank you.